start recording the session and I'm going to go to the very first slide. Okay. Just give me a second here. Uh, can, can everyone see this PowerPoint? Can everyone see yes. this? Yes. 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 Okay. yes. Okay. I just want to make sure that everyone can see this. All right. All right. So, again, feminist leadership, uh, feminism is clearly a very, very vast body of literature. Um, and so this by no means is encompassing everything that feminism is about. But I just uh, wanted to take a couple of these uh, quotes from two ladies who are doing a lot of work in feminism, on feminist leadership, Dawn Ontario and Debbie Armstrong. And if you guys like, I'll, I'll send you a link to their website and you can certainly look it up. But I found their work very interesting and the definition was very interesting to me personally. So uh, Dawn says the feminist principle of leadership means embracing and sharing the skills and knowledge of individual women and providing opportunities for all women to develop their leadership potential. As feminist organizations, we invest power and trust in our leaders with the expectation they will draw upon feminist practices and processes in our efforts towards equality and inclusion. I thought that really was um, quite a wonderful definition from Dawn's standpoint. And then, of course, uh, Debbie adds, I'm somewhere in the center reaching out, building, and maintaining the relationships that are needed to create the whole. I recognize that my leadership exists to nurture others' learning and to strengthen the fabric, whatever it may be. I recognize that as a leader, I value this image as one in which the attributes of feminist leadership are recognized. So I, I thought that was, um, <clears throat> that was a wonderful take on what uh these women consider to be feminist leadership from their of course from their standpoint um just moving on okay i'm going to go to the next slide women and minorities are the fastest growing okay demographic of the contemporary workforce and yet very seriously underrepresented when it comes to leadership positions all right. And I think this is this is not only true of the U.S., uh, but it's also very true of India. And I'm sure in the U.K., I, I had an exchange with Charles and Charles uh, wrote to me something a couple of days ago, which uh, hit home with me that in his own firm, uh, there are only two women leaders among 17 or 18. I forget what it was. Uh, and, and when I opened the 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 floor out uh i'm hoping that charles will be able to talk to us a little bit about that um and you know even though these women outperform men in many areas yet they are underrepresented from the from the standpoint of leadership roles uh let's, let's just take a look at the next one when the new york times reported the findings of the federal glass ceiling commission on on in 1995 it was not surprising to women and other minorities that the study cited the entrenched stereotypes and prejudices of white men as the major deterrent to minority advancement in the workplace. So by minority, I'm clubbing women and other you know, ethnicities under one. While the situation has since improved, what has not changed is the mindset of both men and women toward women and minority leaders in the workplace. Okay. Uh, what we hope to cover today, and again, I, uh, I just want to share here that uh, some of the concepts that I want to be discussing today have, are more from a psychodynamic standpoint. Uh, and I've taken them from the phenomenal work of Dr. Shelley Rossiniello. Uh, and right down at the bottom, you'll see Shelley's, um, uh, I, I made, I put the citation right there, uh, women leaders on, she worked with women leaders on Wall Street, uh, predominantly in financial services and brokerage firms. 
And she wrote a wonderful paper, The Emergence of a Powerful Female Workforce as a Threat to Organizational Identity. It was, um, it appeared in the American Behavioral Scientist, volume 43, number two. And I can give you all this information if you like. And whoever wants, I can certainly share this four or five slides with you. And so you can have the information. You don't have to make any notes. Don't write down anything. I'll be happy to share this with you. Um, so the, some of the key points that we are going to be talking about and which I op want to open out as a dialogue to everyone is how do men and women in predominantly male dominated organizations respond to the emergence of a powerful female workforce? And two, why do powerful women in the workforce unconsciously identify with powerful male leaders? Three, what elements of the organizational identity are threatened by the sea of change in the workplace, i.e. the fast emerging female workforce? And number four, what are the unconscious fantasies of men and women around powerful women leaders and how are these enacted, contained, expressed, and or projected? All right, so before I go on to the next, into the conceptual part of this discussion, I what I would like to do is to open the floor. And if you would just put a little note in the chat, if you'd like to say something, I'll unmute you. And uh, let's kick off a discussion because I don't want this to be a monologue. Uh, just some of the thoughts that uh, come up for you. We'd love for you to share it with the with the group. Well, sure, Vanita. Just one minute. I'll unmute you. Okay, go ahead, Vanita. Okay, hi, everybody. Uh, hi. One thing I just wanted to share, I was seeing the list of this mail just now, which Anil has sent to people. And out of the 19 people who have shown interest, the 15 are women. Ah. And just now also, <laughs> out of five of us, we just have like, you know, except for Charles, the rest of three of us are women. So much for the interest, you know, in the in this topic. Yeah, I am a man, by the way. I mean, the very feminine <laughs> side to me. <laughs> so, so yeah, I can relate to that. Yeah. So the, that's a that's a great observation. Anybody else wants to? Anything else you'd like to add to that, Vanita? Hello. Yes, Anil. Yeah, okay. Yeah. Anything else you'd like to add? All right, Charles. Just just give me a second. No, no, just this observation. Just All right. Yeah, thanks. Okay, okay, great. Uh I'm gonna give it to Charles. Go ahead, Charles. You're on. Unmuted. You're yeah. on. Hi. Um I'm not sure I can answer or uh have things on all of your topics because I think some of them do require getting into the female psyche, but yeah. on the first yeah. one, um, I uh, I used to be a partner in Deloitte in London. There are 600 partners mm -hmm. in the Lon uh, in the UK, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and out of that 600, only 500 uh, sorry 500 were men, 100 were women. Mm -hmm. So only 20 percent, although more than half of the joiners were female. Mm -hmm. And in terms of um, how do the men tend to react uh, to the women? when they were coming forward. Um, my observation, and I used to share an office with a female partner, mm -hmm. she felt that uh, we created a sort of boys club which was hostile uh, towards her. So uh, in other words, we'd all go out to the pub for a beer and you know, not take account of the fact that she might not want to do that. Mm. Um, we'd have dinners, partners dinners where our wives were expected and of course you know, she didn't have a wife, in fact she was single. Um, and so creating a sort of environment which um, is hostile towards women. Hmm. So was there so some was sort there of an assumption, sort of an assumption, assumption or, or, or was it really, something, was it really happening? something happening? I don't think it was conscious by the men. I think it's mm. um, the way it's always been. So um, because historically there are more women now than there have been, but um, yes. uh, 
the, the, the sort of culture of the organization has grown up over many years right. and right. Um, is very male centric, male friendly. Mm -hmm. So I don't think it was a deliberate thing. Okay. In fact, you know, okay. particularly at the leadership, we would like to have more women um, in leadership, but um, the people that are most against positive discrimination are actually the women because they want to get there on merit rather than um, have a, a special route into leadership. Mm -hmm. Interesting. Mm -hmm. Interesting. All right. So I'm going to go right. to Gina so for a second. Gina, for a uh, Gina wanted to give give us her definition of le of uh, feminine leadership. Go ahead, Gina. Hi. Um. Uh. Yeah. If you want, I can just kind of cut and paste from my blog what my definition was. Absolutely. Wonderful. Yeah. Um. Um. Looking from screen to screen here. Um. Uh. You see, I, I talk about feminine leadership, just to make a distinction. Mm -hmm. but my conversation is about, and I just did a video today, I'm in Sydney to deliver a workshop next Wednesday on feminine leadership. Mm -hmm. And the point that I'm making is, uh, there's, there's a, just to let you know what kind of the, the recent initiatives in Australia about this subject, mm -hmm. they're, they're both ahead and behind. And I did a video today, and I can give you all a link later, Mm -hmm. Where they're ahead is, for example, the sex discrimination minister got together 21 male CEOs mm -hmm. from industry, the leading companies, including the head of the army, to talk over the last three and a half years mm -hmm. about, they're called male champions of change. Mm -hmm. Why haven't we got women at the top? And what they've done, these 21 CEOs, is to look inside their own organizations. What are we doing? And they're listening deeply, and now they're putting out some of their findings to their supplier chain, saying, within so many years, unless you've got 50-50 leaders, we're going to review our purchase from you. Mm -hmm. So that's one happening at one end. And on the other end of the leadership spectrum, we've got a new prime minister here who has just appointed a new cabinet, 18 men and one woman. And this is after we've had a female prime minister. And people are absolutely appalled what's happened in the last month. They can't, they're gobsmacked. They can't get over it. And in Australia, in the Global Gender Gap Index that's been released in the last month, Australia was in the top 20. It was position 15. And in the rankings, it's gone down. And it's one of the developed countries. It's gone down nine points mm. to 24, which is unusual for a developed nation to have such a movement. Mm -hmm. And part of that is the political engagement of women on the four measurement systems. Mm -hmm. So that's the backdrop here. They're, you know, they're kind of ahead and behind at the same time. And my workshop that I'm doing is speaking to not just the headcount of women increasing, but when the women are there, they're feeling able to bring their feminine qualities to bear, that they can be there as women, not as another man. And that is the issue, that when women get to the top, they become like men, and that was kind of referred to. So I, I talk very much about bringing the feminine quality in at whatever level of leadership you're at, so that you're there as a woman, bringing your intuition and your caring and compassion and other modalities and other ways, and you're able to operate from that, as opposed to simply being a woman in a, in a peg that's really shaped for a man, uh -huh. and you're having to adjust so that you you appear like a man. So can you can you just talk a little briefly about what women qualities, attributes are you sort of like referring to or this group referring to bringing out for women? Um, I think uh, I, I, my first paragraph here in my blog, I say feminine leadership is about women stepping forward and being willing to lead mm -hmm. whenever they see the need in corporate, mm -hmm. civic, community or family life. Mm -hmm. bringing to bear their whole self on authentic presence and mm -hmm. there's a new form of leadership emerging and it's one where women are leveraging their feminine gifts and values the mm -hmm. world is ready for this shift because it's helping to emerge new solutions where the old ways are no longer bearing fruit right and um i don't want to read anymore but i mean uh, i i did a video today referring to the latest brain research that was issued by dr daniel dr daniel Amen, who talks about how women's brains are more active in 85% of areas and they're particularly active in, and they enable women to bring forward five particular capacities that make them better leaders. So he talks about women being wired for leadership mm -hmm. and I was referring to that. One of those is empathy. 
Another one is the ability to make um, uh, longer term thinking. Right. Now, do you happen to have a link to the, um, is it on YouTube? Can we, can, can you share the link with us? My video, yes, it's on YouTube. Okay. Uh, all right. So late, if you want to do it later, you can send it to me and I'll share it with the group if that's all right with you. Yeah, I'm just, I'm just putting it in the window now. Oh, okay, there you the go. Event. Okay. Yeah. All right. And that's, uh, that's the link to your video? That's the link to the blog. It's on the blog. And I'm going it's to the blog the now blog. to find the link to the actual video. But it's right. the, the story is there. And apparently, you've also written a book on feminine leadership, right? I'm writing one. <laughs> oh, you're writing one. Okay. I saw I'm something writing on it. I'm writing it. All right. That's, that's great. This was really uh, very, very helpful. That's nice. To know, so I'm going to. Unmute. I'm giving the. Austri I mean, okay. I'm not. I don't need to talk about England and my experience there. I am actually having a live conversation in Australia, so I'm kind of. I am present to what's happening here, so that's why I, I thought I'd give you a brief. And I actually think that, that what they're doing with the male champions of change is very forward thinking. And I don't know of anywhere else where mm -hmm. men have got together and said, "What are we going to do specifically?" That is wonderful, and I'd like to. Um... I'll I'm find links for that as well. That a little bit more. This would be. This is very, very interesting. It'd be interesting to benchmark with some, for some of my clients that I work with here. Um, I, I think this would be very interesting from their standpoint. So thank you for sharing that. Uh, let's see. Uh, would anybody else like to add something to either what Gina said? All right. Okay. So let me just open you up uh, to unmute you, Rosemary. What would you like to add? Um. I, I'm not sure that I want to add. I was fascinated with what uh, Gina said. Mm -hmm. uh, but the only thing I was puzzling about is when mm -hmm. we say powerful women, um, maybe it would be useful to think about what we mean. Ah. Um, because to me, um, there are very many ways of understanding power. Ah, and uh, I think uh, feminine leadership understands power in a different way. Mm. So... Um, uh, so I'm, I, I, I think that's something to keep in mind as we go along. Yes, yes, interesting. And there was a reason why, of course, I added there uh, the expression powerful. Uh, this power, of course, uh, is, is different and exercised differently in different contexts. And it's not necessarily one, you cannot paint it with the same brush. Uh, power means different things to different people. So yeah, this was, uh, this was anything else you'd like to add, Rosemary? Ah, uh, no, not for the moment. Okay. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Okay. Uh, how about others? There's a lot there in this slide. If you want to talk about, I mean, one thing that we could talk about is what Rosemary said. What is, what does power mean to you from the standpoint of leadership, or uh, from standpoint of Feminine leadership. Okay. Uh, yeah, just one second. Uh, let me unmute you, Somali. Yeah, go ahead, Somali. Yeah, this is just one concern. Uh, yeah. When I hear about uh, the you know, feminine qualities and when I hear about, I, I kind of agree with what Gina said. In fact, um, in one of the interviews of the Pepsi CEO, uh, she had said that she brings in a lot of her femininity and her feminine qualities and her strengths that emerge, uh, that are there within her as a woman, uh, her instincts which are sharper, which she feels are sharper than men. Uh, one of the concerns that I uh, realize in my workplace is that it is also a way of getting set up in your femininity. Mm -hmm. Because the permissibility of moving in with the man within you becomes less and less. In fact, uh, you know, to emerge as a whole, the man and the woman within me, mm. uh, becomes less when you start identifying only the feminine forces within you. Ah. I agree to the feminine forces, but I'm also seeking that where is the right balance? Because on one hand, uh, what I see in workplaces happening is uh, the, the um, 
opposite sex i would not I, i'm not trying to blame here that the man is doing it but saying that the opposite sex as it is tries to push you with your femininity making you seem you know uh, wanting you to act like a woman and i'm not saying is the it's anybody's fault at the same time i see the woman herself trying to identify herself somewhere as a woman or completely denying the woman part and moving in as a man as you have written in the second question right um unconsciously identifying with the powerful male leaders somewhere adopting that so my concern is uh, what is the right balance and how is it that the woman is going to find the balance uh, very interesting especially in times of uh, decision making especially in times of um, work splits mm -hmm. uh, uh and um, pr probably crisis yes then mm. So it's uh, just a concern. I, I'm I'm waiting for more to emerge. So that is that is that, very that is that is a, that is very profound. Thank you. Um, yeah. Would anybody like to add to what Somali said? Well, my understanding from what where Somali is going with this, and Somali and I have done a phenomenal amount of work together in uh, the virtual setting and also face to face as co-leaders. And co-facilitators, so I know. Uh, kind of, I don't want to assume that this is what Somali is saying, but what Somali is perhaps alluding to is how do we bring, uh, not just from the standpoint of a woman bringing in those feminine attributes, but from the standpoint of a woman, not only bringing those attributes, and how does she balance the male side within her, um, and uh, also those men who. Um, like Gina's talking about champion are championing the cause of the women in the workplace. Um, how do those men who have that uh, mental equity and the compassion and the understanding and awareness, um, how do they bring in those feminine traits into the organization? And how do they then balance those with the, with their masculine side? This is a very interesting question. Uh, yeah. Okay. So, Gina, uh, let's let's unmute you. Go ahead, Gina. Uh, why don't you talk about that a little bit? I think that um, something that I've learned. I think a lot of my work has been very informed by Dr. Rian Eisler. I don't know. Do you all know Dr. Rian Eisler? Uh, not that I. Can Dr. See. Rian Eisler is um, an eminent. Um, uh, she's. Uh, lawyer, activist, author. She wrote the book *The Chalice and the Blade*, and ah, uh, yes, I've read the book. Yeah, yeah. Seminal book, and her most recent book in the last five years is a book called *Caring Economics: The hmm. Real Wealth of Nations*. And mm -hmm. I trained with her as a conversation leader. Mm -hmm. And what she talks about in there, from her study of thirty thousand years of human culture, mm -hmm. is that societies are organised in one of two ways: either, you know, dominator perspective, where you have hierarchy, or a partnership perspective, which is where instead of power being held by fear and control, you have power within the relationships, and there's a more equitable balance, and it's express like the Nordic countries, so all, all, all of the Nordic countries are in the top 10 of the uh, least amount of gap in the Global Gender Gap Report. And what she says in there is that in that hierarchical system, which we have different expressions of in our organizations, in our governments, in, in our countries, is there is one gender that's more important than the other in the hierarchy. There's one, one nation, one, one sexuality, one religion. There's always somebody's more important than the other mm. and it deeply embedded in the culture so you have this as a as a subcultural mindset over which you put legislation but in the psyche we, we, we still have this belief that feminine is less valuable so that's the that's the unconscious operating system and the conscious operating system in varying degrees so therefore I purposely use the word feminine leadership because it's it's if I, if I work around it and say, well, let's call it yin and yang and balance, mm -hmm. we're not addressing the word feminine, which is held as less important. And when I'm in my feminine, I, as a whole baggage of, well, feminine, it's not really, it's not part of business. Bringing these two words together, feminine and business, is really calling for people to examine what they think about feminine, not just women. It's, it's safer to use the word women. So I'm really, you know, I have got people reacting to it and I'm, 
speaking to those reactions of well, what do you think feminine is and that's the discussion point that somehow I'm in, I'm in my less than because I'm feminine when I step into a leader then I'm in this neutral zone effectively I'm operating like everybody else and the dominant culture is male so I have to get in my masculine to survive in that system so I think that um, where women have to be in there to, to survive like everybody else we have to, and I've put personal experience of years of doing this, yeah. my successful uh, way of being was operating purely from my masculine, completely unconscious that there was another way of working. And I developed my feminine qualities, so I have a choice mm -hmm. for how I work. I'm consciously operating from one or the other, whereas I think until you really deeply understand the two, you're going to be operating potentially from a masculine way, because that's what the culture is expecting from you. Mm -hmm. Very interesting. Uh, thanks for sharing that, Charles. You, you wanted to say something? Go ahead. I'm muted. Go ahead. So just building on what Gina's been saying, I think it's an interesting um, thing also to, to go back to what do we mean by power. And uh, for me, it's the ability to influence. And I think that comes from both um, personal authority and positional authority. Uh -huh. And I think the feminine aspects are really good um, at exercising influence um, through personal authority, through the, through the relationship side of things. But um, actually that ends up meaning a lot of women are sort of the power behind the throne and uh, are influencing things through people, through men. Um, but to get positional authority, you do have to bring out the masculine side because that's where the that's the rules of the game really. That in order to get promoted into positional authority, you really need to to play by the the rules that exist there today. So mm. I can see these two sides um, having different ways of um, exerting power, but ultimately, uh, in terms of leadership positions as we think about them in organisations. Uh, I can see that you really have to use more of the, the male side to to really progress. And certainly my experience has been that um, women that have been successful um, have often been more masculine than the men. Oh, wonderful. Wow, wonderful. Um, um, let's just, let's just, I, it does uh, anybody like to add? Clearly we've got some, some really wonderful things that Gina shared, Somali shared, now Charles has shared. I'm sure this evokes um, some feelings and, and, and thoughts in others. So if you want to say something, uh, has okay, all right, Somali has more to say, all right. Uh, Somali, go ahead, please. Uh, you know, the, the, I have a funny observation where, where there are two leaders, for example, the parallel leaders, one is a man and one is a woman. I, the kind of work distribution that happens, you know, the, the, if, if something is coming up, the hospitality part will go to the woman, the man will take up the front role, you know, the, the, uh, uh, many other things. It is always, um, uh, the distribution of work is, is very gender biased, I would say. And especially where the man and women, they are holding parallel roles in, in, a, in an organization with similar uh, profiles. And uh, that is interesting to see. I think Vinita would like to add something yes. to this. I, yeah. I don't know. I just thought I'll make. Yeah. Go ahead. Go ahead, Vinita. Uh, Vinita, go yeah, ahead. I would just like to share my own personal experience. Yeah, I would just like to share my own personal experience. Mm -hmm. I, I have grown up uh, studying mathematics and then uh, chose mechanical engineer. I, I mean, I did my mechanical engineering, which everybody dissuaded me at that point of time that, you know, why, like, you know, women are supposed to take electronics and telecommunication and computers and uh, electrical. Uh, so I was alone in a class of 80 uh, guys and uh, I remember that half my life you know I uh, actually tried to do things uh, which were very male like in fact I remember I used to 
you know wear pants and shirts and used to tuck in and used to feel very good about it and you know <laughs> so on and so forth i used to have like really short hair and some of those kind of things and um, you know i in fact you know even the vehicles that i used to choose i used to ride a scooter because for me the kinetic and you know some of these uh, non geared vehicles are women's thing so constantly you know getting on to the slightly heavy bikes and even when i bought my car i wanted to buy a big car so yeah. you know half my life i actually struggled to show my power i mean i am i'm very frail i'm like all of 45 kg but i always wanted to show i can do big things and now half of life like half of my life now at this point of time i am trying to undo all of that so it's like wow. you know, such a struggle i mean i find it sometimes so ridiculous that you know how years you know i was just trying to make so much effort just to you know look like them ah so from a from a phenomenological standpoint what does it mean to you vinita from um for that 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 transition what does that transition mean to you from identifying so strongly with the male uh, uh, side and now morphing into this coming of your own as if you will uh, into this feminine side what yeah, does that mean is, to you yeah it is it's a, you know i was i was denying so much of uh, you know a side of me it's you know the side of me to you know look uh, look feminine you know wear feminine clothes do the things like you know uh, it's like you know um, if if i am if i'm taking flights or if i'm lugging my luggage i used to take a lot of pride you know i can lift bags and you know and i was not taking help of others and uh, i mean it was and now when i am i am letting people do that i mean i see a certain beauty in also you know uh, receiving help and uh, also accepting things the way um, you know the things can be rather than you know i what, what i i think what i want to share is that i think for half my life the life was a struggle mm. so why do you say that it was a struggle because i'm trying to do something which is which was not natural okay does it feel like a struggle to you now perhaps it didn't feel like a struggle to you then right it it was a struggle but ah. there was this whole desire to you know to ah. you know, come and as in you know work shoulder to shoulder ah, so, so that was it... the whole aggressive and the ambitious side aha uh-huh. there's a desire to identify with the strong male uh, yes Right? Yes. Was it also to identify yes. with the powerful male side within you or, or on the outside? I don't know. I think all I know is this that I was, you know, it was like really working with blinkers. And mm. you know, just I used to I used to find take a good pride that you know I can do conversation, you know, you know standing alongside with them and uh, i can do intelligent conversation and i don't i don't like to talk about a color of a nail polish and what is the fabric of a sari or you know so on and so forth aha that's really bringing to life this uh, this key point for us this uh, identification with men in the workforce and 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 a lot of that perhaps is also unconscious for a lot of people yeah so what does that mean uh, that unconscious identification and it continues i see it all the time happening sure uh gina go ahead go ahead gina I'm just interested. Yeah, can you hear me? Yeah, sure. Yeah. Okay. Um, I, I do follow popular culture a lot and see what the messages are in there. And there's an in- and I watched again the movie Legally Blonde. I don't know whether anybody knows yeah, that movie. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You all know that one. You know, it's Legally Blonde one, Legally Blonde two, and in London now, Legally Blonde is a is a West End show. I don't mm. know about the rest of the world, but there's a very powerful story in there. 
of the pink nail varnish, because this is what Vanita was saying about resisting talking about color and nail varnish is if it would diminish you in some way. You know, don't want to talk about that <laughs> in that part of your life. Mm -hmm. um, and this was, she arrives at Harvard with the little dog in the pouch handbag. And because she's everything the blonde is and all the pink, uh, with tremendous humor, and, and, and Reese Withers <laughs> plays it wonderfully, it somehow diminishes her standing as, well, you can't be intelligent, you can't be a lawyer. Well, she emerges top of her year extremely clever and still feminine. So she, I think, is a lovely role model for younger women to say, I can be pink, I can have the nail varnish, I can do all those things, I can be part of a sisterhood, and I can be smart and successful. I think that's a tremendously important shift for young people because I think in earlier years we got the message is if you if you read women's magazines and this is what the deputy prime minister's wife said in the English newspapers recently if we talk about ma women's magazines issues we're trivial if we do anything that departs from the male script then you know we're seen in in some way that's not positive so I think redefining femininity and being strong and powerful and feminine in, in the sense of interested in the girly, frilly things doesn't diminish us in any way. So I just wanted to add that. <laughs> that that's, that's an interesting twist to that. And so the, my, my next question, I guess, to the group would be, uh, and you may or may not agree with me, but I've just put it out there anyway, what elements of the organizational identity are threatened by the sea of change in the workplace, i.e. the fast emerging female workforce? Uh, do you see that at all? Okay, so Charles, uh, you're saying you don't see it. Uh, Charles, go ahead. So you don't see it in UK? I'm muted. So you don't see it in UK? I think I, I don't. Uh, I don't see it as a threat to business. Um, as a matter of consultant, I actually think that um, uh, diversity actually strengthens businesses, mm -hmm. and um, I think businesses. Uh, some some of the work we sometimes do is helping to unblock problems in leadership teams and I often think the problems are caused by um, the chief executive recruiting people in his own image and having a lot of alpha males who all got strong egos mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. if there was a woman amongst them um, it would it would make life so much easier for them because um, it, it would bring a different perspective and find ways of unlocking confrontation that, that the men suffer from. So I see it as something that would be extremely positive. Mm -hmm. All right. All and, right. Gina, and Gina and doesn't, Gina. Gina doesn't agree totally that it, perhaps you don't see it, Charles, but Gina seems to think others see it, right? Other men see it as a threat? Gina, you want to say something about that? Yes. I, I think Charles has a very enlightened attitude, and, and there's, a, there's a lot of men like Charles who oh. have learned to balance their masculine and feminine, open to it, they see it's a good thing, have role models for it. Mm -hmm. And yet, at the same time, I think either men don't admit it, or there are a group of men who do feel threatened. Uh -huh. And I think that, and I, you know, I'm really interested to find out more about this. I think from talking to some men, I think it comes from the hierarchical thinking of men. If something's going up, then something's coming down. So if, because I'm writing a book called The Rise of the Feminine, if the feminine's coming up, therefore the masculine is coming down, which isn't the case. Mm. But what does what does the new masculine mean? If I'm not the, the breadwinner in the authority and holding all those things that are part of the masculine, what is this new masculine? What does it now mean? And then some of you may have heard of a book called The End of Men, which is about the, the increase in the number of women graduating with higher qualifications. They're getting the better jobs. There's a whole generation in their 20s who are paid more than men. And so therefore, they're going to have to marry down, as it were, that they will, they will get more than their men. You're going to have professional women. There aren't enough professional men for them to marry, and there's a generation of young women who will be marrying men who will be the house husbands. What does this do to the masculine 
psyche and the masculine ego now that's in their 20s but men in their 50s now these older generations what does it mean to them that suddenly they're having to concede power so i think that the internal dialogue is what you know it's like being less than because there is this rise in feminine and the, the, the rise isn't wanting to take away from the men but culturally i think we all have to renegotiate the terms of what it means to be a masculine man and what it means to be a feminine woman. Wow. So I like this, uh, this dynamic that it, it, it's perceived by a man that if a woman, the fem, feminism is rising in the workplace, then the male side is coming down for some reason. It's being threatened. Uh, that, that's a really, really interesting concept. Um, and uh, so, you, you, so you might add that Perhaps some of the anxieties that are stirred up uh, unconsciously are because of that, that, you know, because the paradigm, the frame is that if something goes up, something must come down. Why can't two, uh, two things, two entities rise together? Why can't they co-create a culture, right? I think the archetypal story, if you know about the condor, is this, uh, this mythical animal that's flying with this... One of, its, one of its wings is broken. It's, so the masculine wing is having to do more work. And now the feminine wing in the archetypal story is repairing itself and it's now helping this bird fly with both wings working. So this is this, the feminine aspect is that we've been held back. Now we're coming to the fore to help the men. So it's both of us working together in this new world. But I suppose not everybody sees the story like that and you can fall into the thinking that something's moving forward therefore something's moving back but that's mm -hmm. not the case where women see that right right that's 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 wonderful thanks for sharing that i'm going to go to rosemary yeah go ahead rosemary yeah i i just wanted to go back to what gina had said earlier which was you know the the two kind of organizing principles in organizations and i was thinking about indian society mm. and the organizing principle in indian society is of of very clear hierarchy. I mean, mm. we, we've managed to maintain the caste system, and uh, mm. we have we have a growing uh, imbalance between uh, men and women. I mean, the the, the infant uh, infanticide, female infanticide rate, for instance, is growing. So we're, you know, I I'm I don't really work with the corporate sector, so it's not very easy for me to say whether men are feeling more threatened. Mm. But I work with the development sector, and I think men are extraordinarily threatened by uh, the rising uh, female leadership in, in this sector, because it challenges uh, the very basic principles on which uh, society is ordered. Uh, women's ways of uh, leading are often far more, um, uh, you know, uh, uh, well, well, just less masculine in the masculine principle way mm. and I think um, you know when I took charge of an NGO seven years back and it was a very masculine NGO mm. I had uh, one of the general body members uh, telling me three years down the line that it's dreadful you know you've converted this into a, a, a feminist organization because oh, I just I, I think just by uh, having a woman in charge uh, we just created much more space for very, very strong young women to come in and uh, work there on on issues which would typically be seen as male, which was, you know, national level policy, advocacy, running campaigns. And uh, we did it extraordinarily successfully. But it was very frightening, uh, even for general body members to, um, you know, watch the transformation in this organization. I think it's extraordinarily threatening. Uh, and it's very sad because I think uh, we are, I mean, the world desperately needs both those principles today. Uh, really, uh, really desperately needs them. So, so Rosemary, yeah, so as, a, as, just... a, as a professional, as an educationist, as someone who clearly directs group relations conferences, so you do a lot of experiential, very in-depth work. What does it yeah. mean? What does it mean to you? What is the essence of that meaning to you that uh, even though there are India has made so many strides, economically, financially, globally, whatnot, and yet we're, we're in that respect, we're so, I hate to use the word backward, but uh, not progressed enough. 
in that in that role. What does that mean to you as an evolved woman? Well, I don't know about evolved, but I, I think <laughs> I, I, I think I've uh, well. The only way that I have worked with this is that I have primarily chosen to work in these areas of uh, you know okay. I I I do a lot of work, for instance, on the issue of uh, Dalit rights, mm. because to me it's it's a very similar phenomena, which is on on caste on caste based uh, discrimination. Mm. Uh, we've run group relations conferences on the yeah. theme of caste based discrimination. Wow. So, um, yeah, I, 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 I just work in sectors which uh, have constantly challenged the image of, uh, you know, of India shining. So, I, I and I think uh, working with uh, processes and uncovering unconscious processes are very, very critical to, um, to working off this sheen of, you know, what seems to be progress, but... Uh, but we really need to be doing a lot of lot of work uh, under under that cover to um, identify processes which are very very strongly held within our society. And to, to me, the gender discrimination and caste are very very similar processes. There's not really much difference. It's mm -hmm. like racism and many similar hierarchical processes. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Interesting. Yeah. Very interesting. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, Vinita, you had said, written something there. Can you just add on that or expound on that a bit? Um, one second, let me just think. Yeah, uh, you said you don't know about the yeah, threat, um, but you definitely see women making their presence felt in significant ways. You want to talk about yeah, that? Yeah, I mean, it's, uh, I think I just want to, I just want to, um, you know, acknowledge each one of us over here uh -huh. and, uh, you know, what is, you know, how Gina has spoken and how Somali has spoken and how Rosemary has spoken and, uh, you know, and how, how I have been doing whatever the work I have been doing. I think each one of us are doing, um, we, we are in leadership role in, in uh, this, the spaces that we are working. And I can, I can definitely share uh, my personal experience that um, I, um, if, if I am, if I am able to do what I'm able to do, uh, there is, there is acceptance of me uh, from the men around, uh, you know, whether I'm in the corporate work, whether I'm in learning space. And uh, the only thing I know is that sometimes I have to, I really have to work hard. You, I really have to prove myself to you know then i will be taken seriously ah, that is you know that is something i and and you know honestly i must share this that perhaps i have you know i am i am at a stage where i i have i perhaps have another 20 years of you know work ahead of me and unless you know something really significantly uh, you know some significant change happens i actually see for even next 20 years that I will need to walk that extra mile to, oh to you know, make my oh. presence felt. Uh, so, so I have a follow-up question uh, on that. Vinita, so when you say that you have to work extra hard, overcompensate, uh, you know, are you somewhere suggesting, and I know you're probably not, but I, I, I just have to ask you this anyway. Are you suggesting that to be seen, to be recognized, to be acknowledged, you have to be more like men, walk that line with men. Because if, if it's a male-dominated culture, isn't that what the paradigm is? No, so what, what I'm trying to say is that, that like, for example, I, I, I'm running a company in partnership with my colleague. Every single place, whenever I want to share, people actually, everybody, it's been like 16 years, but everybody takes it for granted that I'm working for him. Oh, God. It's like, you know, it's, it's, it's the assumption people make that, you know, that, you know, you, and the way, what I'm trying to say is that when they see the work, it's like, you know, like, for example, if, if, I, if, I, if I ask a smart question, if I make an intelligent comment, if I'm in a workshop, you know, I really do a like superlative job, then people will come and turn around, oh, you are like really, really good. 
and that is something you know so it's like you know you have to begin every single place you have to begin from nothing to something and that is something is a uh, little bit of if i may use uh, you know my sadness you know uh -huh. because i just have to be on my toes all the time jeez that is that is that is thank you for sharing that uh, i you know it, it's a painful experience i'm sure uh, let me just go to uh, gina gina can you talk a little bit about that uh, i'm trying to do multitasking here to see if i don't miss anything the gender reconciliation initiative yeah i think I can speak to that, but did Charles want to say something? Oh, I'm sorry. Um, did I miss you, Charles? Charles, would you like to go first? I'm so sorry. I, you know, this is. I'm just trying. Go, Charles. Would you like to add something I'm first? Go, Charles. Would you like to add something? <laughs> well, first? as I'm a man, I think it's my place to go first. <laughs> okay. All right. Go ahead. Okay. All right. Go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> go ahead, please. Go ahead, please. <laughs> um, I was picking up on uh, really what Rosemary was saying. And I think um, talking about uh, culture in India and um, the class or the caste system and uh, distinctions um, about class and about gender uh, being very prevalent. And I think that, um, you know, based on the research my daughter's doing, uh, you know, there are, there are legal things in place now to support women and make it illegal to discriminate against women. Um, uh, so a lot of the things that are holding women back are actually social um, and cultural. If you go to the Scandinavian countries, uh, you do find um, very different attitudes there. And um, I think that uh, it was interesting to hear about house husbands because um, going back to the women that were partners in Deloitte, uh, most of them were either single or did have a house husband at home. And I think more women, it's, it, it is impossible to run two professional career, uh, careers and bring up a family. And so one has to go. And I know lots of cases where the woman has been earning more money. Well, I wouldn't say lots of cases, but some cases. The woman's given up her job um, and the man's kept his going, even though the women had, had a, a better job. Mm -hmm. um, and at the moment, men can't really um, cope with not being the breadwinner with being a kept man um, and these kind of connotations. Um, and so one of the things that is holding women back is men's confidence in themselves or their ability to stand behind their wife and let her have the lead career. And if I think about my parents, uh, their generation, it was just normal for the wife to give up work as soon as she got married. Um, and I think we're going through a transition in the 60s. We did have the feminist movement and uh, we have had a, a massive change in attitudes, but those attitudes were in place for thousands of years. And I think it's going to take a generation or two, really, um, for, for the changes to filter through. But it can be helped, and what the Scandinavian countries have shown is that by um, giving men as much paternity leave as women get maternity leave, um, by providing free childcare um, before school age and things like that, that does help. Um, to make some of the, the, the social changes that are necessary for, for women to be more successful in business. Mm -hmm. Interesting. All right, Gina, let's go to you now. Go ahead. Yeah, um, just before I speak about the gender reconciliation, just building on what Charles has said there about, you know, the, the Nordic countries and the male breadwinner. Actually, in California, uh, in Silicon Valley, there's a lot more role modeling for dual careers, as it is hard for two professions, but Sheryl Sandberg is, you know, the famous woman who has this superlative career as the CEO of Facebook, wrote the book about women leaning in, and um, has a family, and her husband is the head of uh, another major organization, and um, it's easier in, in Silicon Valley for dads to take time off to be the house husband so they're, you know, California often models new ways in, in the way that the Nordic countries do. So things are shifting and happening there. Really don't know how Cheryl Sandberg manages to do what she does, but I read an article recently of everybody of people who start new businesses saying we need a Cheryl, which is a woman who comes in and makes everything happen as the as the women do, 
and uh, doesn't affect the ego of the male founder of the organization because uh, you've got Zuckerberg who can work with Cheryl because she is a woman. I don't know that Zuckerberg could work with a, a male COO who could be behind the scenes because this aspect of women being be, you know, the power behind, Cheryl is out there as well as being behind the throne. She's next to the throne and out there on her own throne as it were. So that's an interesting dynamic. And um, just speaking about the gender reconciliation, I met with these people recently. I don't know whether anybody's heard of them, but they are a 20 odd year organization from Northern America doing gender reconciliation work out of South Africa. Um, excuse me, modeled a lot in South Africa. And they've partnered up recently with the Desmond Tutu Foundation and they're doing courses for gender reconciliation on the back of the truth and reconciliation work. Now that tr truth and reconciliation work has now left South Africa and Canada are now using it for conversations with their indigenous peoples because there's a lot of, you know, we're talking about the caste system, there's a lot of discomfort in the way Canadians have related to their indigenous people, a lot of repair work being done. So they're using the truth and reconciliation model to help them there. And this gender reconciliation model is looking at this reconciliation of the genders. And it's not something that's necessarily yet taken off in the West or the Northern Hemisphere, but it's very much a, a present conversation in South Africa. And there's one or two universities now that when the students start on their course, they have a one-day gender course, which is to reevaluate gender. And I met the chairman of this um, organization. He said to me that he was shocked to be in some of these trainings and find out that men raped, men looked at women's group and they targeted women that they would choose to rape, um, plan it in advance, and they found out that this wasn't a cool thing to do in this gender reconciliation course. Wow. And they, they were shocked. And they really then were confronted with the fact, well, what is my masculinity then? Because it was part of their masculine identity to do that. So a very warped one, but that's in that cultural mean. Um, so they had to rethink that. And this is, you know, at one level, in the rethinking of masculinity, there is a group of people who see their rights, so physical and sexual rights over women as being part of the masculine identity. So there's a lot of things to unpick and I just wanted to flag up this organization because it's very interesting what they're doing. Wow, that is great. All right. Um, just moving on, uh, the last about 30 minutes, I, I just want to talk about, and not just me talking about it, but I, hopefully to catalyze some conversation around this. This is very psychodynamic, very psychoanalytic, very Freudian. Uh, so don't be scared. <laughs> the The idea is only to share with you some concepts out of uh, Shelley Rossiniello's work, uh, which I thought were very interesting. Uh, to in other, in order to understand better and, and to dig a little bit deeper into what are the unconscious anxieties. So she talks about the enactment of envy, Freud's theory of penis envy. Uh, and Clara Thompson's 1942 suggestion that women have envy because they lack a penis may be symbolically true in hard-driving, highly competitive cutthroat cultures on Wall Street, where there's a pressure to perform, you know, hard-driving, um, uh, you know, uh, forward-thinking, get out there, aggression. Uh, so the woman envies a man's greater freedom more upward mobility, and the relative lack of conflict around some basic fundamental drives. A man's penis, as a symbol of power and aggression, represents to a woman the freedom to be, to force one's way, and to get one one wants. But this regressive pull toward phallic supremacy in many organizations is so irresistible that even a strong woman leader may be unable to resist it and or become impacted by the envy. So I just, it's a mouthful here, but I just thought, um, uh, you know, uh, perhaps you may want to say something about this. I, I know you're, I immediately saw your reaction, Charles. So Charles, why don't you go ahead and tell us something? <laughs> <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> Great to have the opportunity to talk about this first. <laughs> no, please. <laughs> go ahead. Um, I don't get it. <laughs> I simply don't get it, and I'm not sure 
I mean, my wife tries to explain to me about Freud. I, I mean, I think a lot of his stuff on dreams is probably really good, but <laughs> I, I don't know whether it says more about Freud or, or um, anything else. I, I can see the point about male characteristics, <laughs> but I find linking that to a part of the body is, is a stretch for me. <laughs> interesting. <laughs> interesting. <laughs> All right, Gina, would you like to add something to that? Um, I think that, I uh, was just making a note, that I think that Freud's been way, <laughs> just think he's been overtaken by Carl Jung. I don't think he's got that much credit to say. But, uh -huh. but I, think that, I think that maybe that was a, a period of time in the evolution of the feminist movement. Yeah. I think we're in an era now where we've moved away from the, the feminist working against something and fighting for something mm -hmm. where there's an energetic imperative on the planet, there is a prophecy, there's a movement of feminine energy that's appearing in men, allowing men to be more compassionate, to feel their emotions and to show them that's rising in men, it's mm -hmm. rising in women. I think where we're going is everybody understanding what feminine energy is in our intuitive and spiritual capacities, in yes. our compassion, in our heart connection, and take aside all management positions. I think this is where the movement is, that we're all getting into our feminine energy and our feminine power. And this envy, you know, it doesn't, it doesn't come into it. It's not about the masculine. It's about humanity moving into our heart space and our, our intuitive abilities and honoring other ways of being which are known as feminine. So I think that it's not uh -huh. about that envy. Wonderful. So I'm going to give this mic to now uh, Rosemary. Rosemary, is, Rosemary, would you like to add something here? Um, yeah. The the <laughs> only thing that I wanted to add is uh, I mean I think I think Freud was was brilliant in his work on the unconscious and yes. Uh, yes. but I think like many many people he was a creature of his times and yes. it was. Uh, you know, I, I think we've all moved far beyond uh, Freud's theory of uh, penis envy. Yeah. I would just want to second what uh, Gina said, which is um, Jung's work was is much more on both the feminine and masculine principles. And Jung's work was has been a lot on integration. Yes. Uh, how, how integration is one's life's work, whether one is a man or a woman. Yeah. And um, Jung also added, uh, and, and subsequently many more people added the whole dimension of the spiritual, um, which again, um, you know, uh, Gina referred to indirectly earlier, but more directly now. And how do we bring in those qualities uh, in ourselves and learn to integrate them and not, and, and recognize that these are needed if, you know, the world is to be you know, at all a more human place. Uh, so um, I think these are the um, these these are the options opening up for us. And uh, uh, unfortunately, the word feminist um, is, is seen as aggressive. You know, that's that's really yes. very unfortunate. Uh, people think. I mean, people when when they're upset with me, they say, "Oh, you're so feminist," and you know, <laughs> <laughs> it's like. <laughs> It's it's very amusing, but I think if we can look more at feminine, masculine, mm. what are we running away from on both ends? You know, there are times when I, I'm afraid of of exercising the masculine parts of myself. Mm -hmm. I, I I try to hide them, whereas they are parts of me. So, I think the work really is about, uh, you know, integrate integration and um, uh, of of of, um, of of understanding how we have been so conditioned by how we've been brought up by the society and culture around us and to find ways of changing that. Yeah. Uh, so whether it's the project that Gina talked about, gender reconciliation or, you know, other work on gender, it's about both sides or Vinita's very beautiful example of years and years of, you know, denying one part of herself. Right. And now finding beauty in reclaiming that. So, that, that is yeah, so, so wonderful. And you know what, uh, uh, Rosemary, this is uh, this is great because bringing in Jung certainly 
Um, uh, and that there was a reason why I brought Freud because I knew Jung is going to be right there <laughs> because because uh, Jung was Freud's student and then sort of in many ways overtook Freud, much to Freud's chagrin. <laughs> you know, Jung really, really, and I love the dialectic that he brings between the anime, anime, anima, and the anemus, or anima, animus, whichever way you want to look at it, the male female attributes in all of us. Um, and how to be able to hold that te- di- di- dialectical tension between what can be seen as op- opposites or antithetical, but do not necessarily have to be that way, right? So yeah. to be able to hold those tensions together uh, is such a wonderful thing. And that is what Gina has referred also to uh, man, uh, you know, unconsciously thinking, oh, so the the, the the feminine is rising, so the masculine is is dropping there somewhere. Why can't both rise together, right? And the way that will happen is through this integration, this individuation within ourselves. So this is, I think, uh, wonderful. And uh, Vinita has written something. You know, I'm going to give the mic to Vinita here. Uh, go ahead, Vinita, please. Vinita. Yeah. So um, in Indian co- yeah, in Indian corporate setting, um, in uh, in in few sectors, there are there are some women leaders have come, and there are very stark example of some of these women who are heading the business, and uh, there are there are so many stories of you know, of they being so, um, you know, so uh, if I may use the word, you know, completely, um, you know, not. Uh, uh, how do I say it? They are like so brutal. They are very brutal and they are very, uh, the people are so scared of them. I mean, I have heard the stories of men who are really, really scared of getting into, uh, getting into, getting into their cabins. I mean, not, not for any things which is like, you know, that they will be harassed to something, but you know, there is this whole fear. And that's where some some of them have, you know, step. They have become, if I may use the word, worse than men. In in in, you know, after that power and after all of that, and which is a very sad part because every single time when I hear a story of a successful woman and she acting it as like, you know, somebody who who who's not. There's no feeling part there. Uh, it's it's very very sad. Yeah. That, that is that is cool. Uh, let's just look at this. Uh, I think it is the final slide. Uh, denying success. Women tend to underestimate. There were some studies done, and I can cite those studies if you like. But uh, denying success. Women tend to underestimate or have lower expectations of success than do men. And, of course, this may have changed. This was done in the late 90s. So, of course, a lot has changed since then. A lot of water has flown under the bridge. On the other hand, a feminist leader may have a different notion of success than a man. The notion may or may not play into the performance metrics. So while the performance metrics is all about hard driving, results orientation, getting the job done, how much you can get done and how quickly you can get done, a woman may look at uh, performance as different than a man does. An attribution study suggests that men may attribute their success to something internal such as acumen, ability, and expertise, and failure to do something temporary, such as bad luck. Women, on the other hand, may attribute success to something external, such as chance or a fluke, and perhaps how hard they tried, as opposed to something more enduring and internal, such as ability, intellect, and talent. What do you folks have to say to that? Gina, is this a merit to that study? Or do you feel that that might be happening? Yeah, there's a, there's a lot of evidence, I mean, that it did exist and still exists. I mean, just one uh-huh. anecdote from the early 2000s. Um, uh-huh. uh, I was part of a feminine group where um, 
somebody said that a company, this is what the, the, the somebody reported, a company was looking for a woman, but you can't advertise for a woman. So they put the ad out, they got a lot of men replying, didn't want a woman. So do you know what they did to get a woman to, uh, uh, more women to apply? Uh -huh. They lowered the salary. Oh my God. Oh, it's God. it's horrible. It's it's because you know women have this uh, internal dialogue of worthiness and uh, mm. what this male champion for change uh, initiative in Australia has recognised is that there's a, there's an innate bravado and courage that men have and research shows that they they, they when they see a, a list of qualities that needed on a on a on a CV for the next job that if they can do 40% of them, fine, you know, they'll put themselves forward, no problem. Mm. A woman has to tick 100% of boxes or more, oh. and, or, or she won't apply because she's not going to do everything perfectly. Jeez. And, yeah, this is this is anecdotal. This is research that supports this very much. The, the book Women Means Business talked about that. Aviva Wittenberg-Cox explains that a lot. And they recognize this, and they're, they're trying to, therefore, do this gender bias of really reaching out and helping the women see their potential and be and, and have male champions and mentors mm -hmm. to push the women from beneath because they see that that's one way to overcome this women having this dialogue about I don't do everything well right. um, and therefore I won't apply. Mm. Interesting. Somali, you wanted to say something? Uh, one of the thoughts that I had was uh, culturally, it is how uh, differently we bring up the boys and the girls. Uh, I can say uh, this is uh, as far as in India, I think it is uh, the girls are taught not to brag, never to own up that they have achieved something. Uh, to be humble is seen to be uh, something of a great value to possess. <clears throat> Uh, whereas the boys, if you, even if you see the small young ones, you know, the toddlers, you know, they will brag that I have done this and that is seen with great pride by the parents and that is what they're brought up with. Ah. So I also ah. see a lot of parenting issues here as to how with different sets of values we bring up uh, the girls and the boys and that later on when they emerge as adults, I think it, it it's a part of their being. So the girls... You know, they, they see whatever they achieve as a chance or a fluke. I mean, even if inside somewhere they do believe that they have worked hard for it, uh, it will take a long time for them to come to that and say, oh, it is my intellect, bloody, I have worked hard for it, and that's why I, I have achieved it. Whereas a boy will be, uh, a man would be very comfortable saying that. So my, I also see as a very uh, this to be a very culture thing, you know. Uh, mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I'm looking at it. From but that I, from what, what what I'm hearing is not only in India but also Gina's experience that and Charles also has sort of agreed agreed with it, right? Right, Charles. So let me just give it to Charles. Go ahead, Charles. Unmuted. Yes, I think that. Um, as I mentioned, my daughter's doing some research and yeah. she's spoken to a number of successful yeah. women and the most consistent thing that's come out of it is this comment about um, men only needing 40% of the attributes uh, to put themselves forward and women needing pretty much all of them. It's consistently come through. So I'm wondering if it's more than just upbringing and, and social things, whether it's something to do with women's wiring um, and I think the interesting challenge, because it is, it really, really is a very, um, uh, a very real thing that stops women being successful, um, is is how we how we deal with it. So I, I like the idea of, of mentoring, um, and um, in fact, the person who put me in touch with with this conference does that sort of work. Um, but uh, not everyone can afford a mentor, and. Um, so I, I think I think it's um, an interesting one. Hmm. Huh. All right. All right. Uh, with that uh, said, we have uh, the last say about ten minutes. Go for it. Anybody wants to add anything to this dialogue? And I'm taking you to the next slide. All right. Who's the C? By the way. Uh, 
I don't know who this this person is, but I I will unmute. Go ahead, C. Um, I didn't register properly, but um, um, I'm uh, I used to be married to Charles. Ah, Caroline, there you are. <laughs> um, I um. Go ahead. I don't really know what to say. So. Uh, it's it just that I did have a career when I was younger, um, uh -huh. and um, I ended up doing um, two jobs, uh, my career job and everything at home, um, and that, that, that also had an impact on my career, that um, it wasn't possible to do everything properly, or even half, half well. Um, and it, and uh, you know, I don't want to make it too personal, really, but but um, that that had an impact on on on. Um, well, I don't have a career now. I, I the whole thing became too stressful for me to kept carry on working, um, and I ended up just um, staying at home because I just couldn't cope with. With working and and having to do everything at, at home. Hmm. So sort of like. So your decision was, uh, Caroline, to just step away from the workplace and just uh, take care of one thing. Well, I would have, I would have liked that that you know. My career to have been supported by by some uh, some support at home. And I think, um, mm, interesting. I can't remember the sort of. I jumped in. I can't remember what the point was that made me say that. But um, what, what, what was the point before? Oh, we we're talking about the forty percent um, right. and and having confidence and and women, uh, women, um, the women that my daughter, our daughter, was interviewing. Feeling that they couldn't do it, um, or uh, that they they couldn't um, th that they they felt they had to be able to do everything, not just part of it. Mm -hmm. But I think men men supporting women at home do does have a big impact. And you know, I I opted out because I just couldn't do everything. Mm -hmm. Well, thank you for sharing that, Caroline. Is there anything else you'd like to add to that? Uh, well, Ch Charles, Charles expressed support but didn't um, deliver on the support. So um, I suppose, um, again, uh, not wanting to make it too personal, I think... No, go ahead. I mean, um, if, you, if you feel okay, uh, this is a very close group. This is all confidential. If you'd like to say something, because I think it, it adds a lot of meaning to this dialogue for uh, to, to feel the... For someone to express the support, but the support is not being delivered, right? Is that what you're saying? Yeah. Uh -huh. And yeah. how does that feel to not have the support delivered? Uh, I, I got very um, run down. I became very ill. Oh, I'm sorry um, to hear that. Physically, mm -hmm. as well as stressed. I mean, my body just, uh, I got ulcers all the time. Um, and I wasn't. Um, I, I wanted to downgrade my job uh, to something that was that would fit in better. Um, but I felt under under pressure to to carry on with my better paid career. And in the long term, I would have been better off downgrading what I was doing to something that wasn't quite so demanding but actually keeping my career going and in the end I just felt I had to give up completely and now that we're divorced <laughs> uh, my job is a cleaning lady I've just been out this morning cleaning and I have uh, a lot of confidence issues because I feel at the age I've got to now that nobody would want to employ me and I talk myself down because I think uh, nobody would want to employ someone who's old, with grey hair, um, and even though um, uh, I probably 
do have some skills, I have taught myself down and um, I feel that until, if, if I was going to go back to my career, that I need to resit more exams um, before I can do that. So I wouldn't have the confidence just to go back into an office and say, uh, here I am 20 years out of date, but I'm absolutely brilliant, whereas a man might do. But th this discussion has actually made me really focus on the fact that I have taught myself down from uh, a highly, highly educated uh, woman into someone who feels that the only job that I can do is a cleaning job. Wow. Thank you for sharing that. Uh, with, it's a very sensitive issue, obviously, for you. Uh, and to share it with, so openly with us, uh, I really thank you for doing that. It, it stirs up a lot of feelings and emotions in me as I hear that. So again, uh, if there, if, would you like to add anything before I move on? For a few well, minutes? I was expecting to be interrupted. Um, I'm usually interrupted when I speak, so it's a bit. Um, um, <laughs> I haven't been following any of the um, the writing actually because I've just been uh, and sort of thinking nobody would be. Um, well, I just expected people to sort of jump in. Really, I wasn't expecting to have the floor for so long. <laughs> so. Yeah, I, we had four children and it was a lot of work, um, mm. but working and having children is, is, is hard. Yes. I don't know if any of you other ladies have children. Mm. I, I would say, I don't want to make an assumption, but I think uh, some of them that I know here have children. Um, and I certainly have two girls, my own, so I know how it has been. Um, so so that, was, that was very sensitively shared. I thank you so much, Caroline, for that. I really do. Okay. So I'm going to go just go um, uh, to, this, to this last piece here, and then we'll wrap it up in the interest of time. Uh, this is, these are some of the unconscious anxieties. Again, they come from studies that have been done. Uh, the only way a powerful woman leader can compete is by either stealing something from him that he has worked hard for or by re taking revenge on him, by humiliating him in the workplace. Uh, men, men have a tendency to fear strong and aggressive women. And I can totally testify to that. I've seen that happen with men. They're very threatened by a very evolved intellectually or emotionally um, I hate to use the word superior, but in some ways more evolved uh, than women. And in, in as much as they have fantasies of being envied for something that women do not possess, a strong and superior penis with magical strength. So an aggressive, highly ambitious woman leader will find her way to the boardroom by sleeping around rather than on her hard work and merit. When she fails, she will inevitably turn to a male leader to bail, him up, bail her out. Just some thoughts on that, and before we wrap up, go ahead, uh, Rosemary. Please, go ahead. Yeah, um, you know, I I kind of am reacting a bit strongly to the inevitableness of your of this <laughs> slide, uh, uh, in the sense that uh, you know it it might happen, but I don't think this is the only dynamic. So well, I'm sure um, it's not. This is just one of the aspects I'm talking. About. Yeah, so 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 perhaps, but you know, I mean, I I think I I I just felt that it was it was said as if this was this was the only way things happen. And, no, this uh, is certainly not. It's yeah. not the gospel truth. It certainly is not the know all, be all, end all of it. I'm just sharing some things from uh, Rusiniella's work, and basically just so so I, I you know if anybody. Oh, I like see. To, okay. Yeah. This is, okay, this is that's all, her work. Oh, yeah, okay, yeah. fine, fine. This was centered more from her work because I thought that there was something very profound about her thinking, but she was going more from this psychoanalytic, psycho psychodynamic, unconscious end of it. And and there can be a variety of other reasons, the other anxieties tremendously. So, Rosemary, it's certainly not, this is by no means um, a generalization. All right, but any thoughts, anybody? 
Uh, let's see. Gina. Here, I'm going to unmute Gina. Gina, go ahead. Um, well, my, my final um, <clears throat> comment would be, um, and really following on, not so much this slide, but Caroline's um, sharing. Thank you. Um, I point again to Dr. Rianne Eister's work on the caring economy, because one of the things she says is uh, the economy is run. Uh, we what we what we measure and value is the is what the what business does and what government does. And underneath that, we have an economy of the household and home economy, the economy of the nature and the stewardship of natural resources, and the economy of volunteer and community. None of that is paid, and it, we don't count it, we don't measure it, and therefore we don't value it. So this aspect of everything that women do, you know, the economy wouldn't exist except we, we run everything. That, that there is that, that we have communities, that we have nature, and we have we bring up children. I mean, that's what the most important thing. But it's not measured in the metrics that we have in society. That we're measuring GDP doesn't count it. And uh, when the Swiss government counted what the woman's contribution was, um, you know, it was 70% of the economy if they counted it. So this is part of a new movement of Brianne says of changing the way we measure GDP. And this is what the global, uh, the World Economic Forum says: you can't change anything that you can't see. And to see it, you need to start counting and measuring it and making it visible. And I think that um, part of the movement of the feminine is not the ignoring of home and being a stress for women. It's how do we as a society support and value the important work of home, homemaking, housework, bringing up the next generation and factor it into life rather than have as a division. So it's a big conversation. There's a lot more to read in Rian Issa's work and that would be my final contribution to say what Caroline shared is really important because we can't, we can't walk away from the fact that there's children and homes and they have to be run somehow and we don't want to be in a position where society does not support women by its childcare policies and its culture. Women need supported in bringing up families and having the choice to have some kind of meaningful work outside the home paid if they want. Wonderful. Well, with that, with that said, um... We're on the time boundary. Uh, if anybody wants to add something real quick, if not, we can uh, end the session. <laughs> I think I'm going to unmute everybody. Right. Thank you. Thank you all. Uh, for your time, for your effort, for the, um, the the thoughts that you all have shared. It's been a wonderful, wonderful, very, very enlightening discussion and uh, certainly given me a lot of stuff to think about and to ruminate on. So um, let's all be in touch. I will send out the recording. The recording becomes a rather large file, but I will send it out anyway. I know Charles, Charles's uh, daughter would like to hear that, and so will the others. It's been... Uh, perhaps one of the more interesting, very profound, very, very substantive discussion um, where a lot of wonderful information has been shared. So I will do the best I can to to disseminate that information out to everybody. Uh, and you'll also see the see the text in that in that recording, including the audio and the and the slides. All right. With that said, thank you again. Uh, it's been a wonderful session. And a good night to um, Gina, who's right there. It's probably 2.30 a.m. in Sydney. Uh, good night to all the other folks who are in India. And Charles, it's still, I guess, late afternoon for you, right? And for me, it's uh, just right around 10.30. So with that, thank you so much and have a great day or night. Goodbye.